All right, we want to welcome you to BBI tonight, you that are here in class, and there'll be some that's absent, will be watching by video. So we appreciate you and uh, thankful that you're a part of uh, Bethel Bible Institute. We're studying the Revelation, and we're in uh, chapter number three. We're studying about the seven churches, and uh, we're going to get right into the lesson here after a short moment of prayer. Father, help us tonight to be a blessing, to be a help. God, I pray uh, for the Holy Spirit's guidance and direction. Without you, Lord, I can do nothing. And I need you tonight above everything else. Give me guidance, direction, guard my lips. Give me wisdom as I teach. Uh, give me clarity of thought and mind and speech. May I impart just what you would have me to, that you might get glory. And we'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. In tonight's lesson, our main aim in, is to show the importance of being in the right church. Amen. Uh, how many different kind of churches can you name? Now, I don't want you to name them, but uh, think about it. How many different kind of churches can you name? I mean, there's a lot of different denominations. Somebody said that there was over 820 denominations plus a lot of isms and schisms. Now, I believe there's more than that simply for the fact that people will come to church, they'll sit under the preaching of the Word of God of a good man of God, and then they'll go to the workplace and they'll begin to discuss it with all the other folks there and uh, they'll begin to say, well, I believe it's like this. And the next one will believe, I believe it's like this. And they develop their own little doctrine and their own little ism or schism. And uh, they forget about being in, in a good Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. And uh, I, I wonder which of these would be uh, classed as uh, a Sardis church or a Philadelphia church. Uh, as you think about the number of churches we have in Wilkes County. we got one just about on every corner uh, in, the, in town and every back road you can think of out here in the country. And uh, tonight we're going to study about these two churches, Sardis and Philadelphia. And uh, we're going to just briefly touch on uh, a couple of things before we get it right into the Scripture here. But uh, what, what is the threefold interpretation of these uh, seven letters that's being written here? Well, number one, <clears throat> they were real churches. I told you that a couple of weeks ago. They were real churches. They were in Asia Minor, and they were established, and they had a different time period. And uh, number two, they represent the entire church age, from the time of Pentecost until the time of rapture. And then number three, there are elements of all these churches in our churches today. You can see it. It's around about us. And uh, briefly, the church of Ephesus, if we, as we studied about it, it was the church that left its first love. You say, well, what was its first love? Winning souls, loving Christ. The church of Smyrna, we studied about it, and it was the church that was both rich and poor. Then we studied about Pergamos, and it was the church that was next door to Satan's throne. <laughs> Think about that. There's some of them real close in America today, the Satan's throne. And then the th church of Thyatira, the church that stood for a few things, but really did not stand against anything. Uh, they, uh, you know, performed continual sacrifice, but really didn't do anything for the glory of God. Now, today our lesson will cover the next two churches, and both which represent, uh, uh, which represent Churches, I believe, in the age we now live in today. And we're going to begin with the church of Sardis. In Revelation chapter number 3, verses 1 through 6, and we'll just read uh, one verse as we go along. But uh, this is the church that was dead and uh, did not know it. Now, can I give you a little illustration? Two little boys was walking down by the pond one day, and they were talking about their knives and how sharp they were and what they could do. Little boys like knives, you know that. And so there was a turtle, had a little mud turtle crawled out up on the bank. And one of the boys grabbed the little turtle up and he was looking at it and he was examining him. And the other said, give him to me. And the other one gave him to him and he took his knife out and cut his head off. And that little turtle's legs and tail was still a wiggling and still a carrying on. And the one that had handed him over to him, he said, look at him. He's dead and don't know it. Amen. He was still moving. Had a little life, but he was dead. 
Think about that in relation to this church. Revelation 3, 1 says, And to the angel of the church of Sardis write these things, saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Did you know you can take a frog from a pond and put him in a kettle of water and turn that water on and begin to heat it? And that frog will lay there and swim around and swim around and swim around till it comes to a boil, and then you know what you got? Frog legs. That's the way a lot of people are in some of the churches they're in today. They're just in there swimming around, swimming around, swimming around, and uh, they're in a dead church. They're, they're going to wind up dead. Uh, you know, as Christians, we need to grow. And, and Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. We just uh, taught about that in the class downstairs. And in Luke 2.40, the Bible says, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Think about that. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a human, and he had to learn some things. And, and then in Luke 2.45, it says, And when they found him, not, this was when he uh, had went to Jerusalem to worship, and they uh, went three days' ver uh, journey before they missed him. So when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Uh, he was alive. <laughs> Amen. We are to be alive. Verse 48 says, And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought the sorry. Now Joseph wasn't his father. <clears throat> but he claimed him. Verse 49 he said, And he said unto them, How is it that thou sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? Capital F. Amen. And uh, they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And uh, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and uh, was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, here is God in the flesh. And notice what the Bible said about him here. He increased in wisdom. He knew all things. Stature and favor with God and man. That amazes me that God would say that about his son when he knew all things. He is God the Son. He is the I Am. And, you know, many times we, we don't think about Jesus in that human body. I, I believe I said last week in here uh, that, uh, you know, His death proved that He was a man, but His resurrection proved He was God. So uh, He was the God-man. Uh, there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Uh, in Luke 3, 21, the Bible says, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying the heaven was open, and the Holy Ghost uh, descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and the voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee am I well pleased. He was endued with power, filled with the Spirit. And uh, Luke 4, 1 says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. You say, well, what happened here? Wasn't, wasn't the Holy Spirit of God with him when he was born? Yes, he was. Wasn't the Holy Spirit of God in him when he grew as a child? Yes, he was. But Jesus grew physically as any other baby. And God chose it that way because he wanted to identify with us and we could identify with Him. Amen? And G Jesus grew in wisdom. That means intellectually. He, he already knew all things. And, and God chose that way. And, and Jesus knew who He was, and, and it was evident from what He said when He was 12 years old there in the temple. He knew He was uh, God's Son, and He knew He must be about His Father's business. In John 3.34, the Bible said, For He whom God has sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto Him. In other words, He was full. Amen. 
God the Spirit was with him. And the Lord did not measure out spirit to be given in part to Jesus. He had it all. He was filled with the Holy Ghost thoroughly, through and through. John the Baptist, uh, uh, we talk about him and uh, about his being filled with the Holy Ghost. In Luke 1.15 it says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. <clears throat> By the way, that's what's wrong with abortion. You know, they may have already killed the, the person that's going to cure cancer. Amen. Luke one thirty five, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which thou shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. You know, we, 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 uh, what we must consider also is the fact that Jesus is a unique person. He, he's uh, the one and only. You know, there are some churches that teach that we are the children of God and Jesus is a child of God. No, He's not a child of God. He's the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. <clears throat> There's a difference. You and I were adopted in when we got saved by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. And it's very difficult for us to, to wrap our minds around who Christ is and all that He is and all that He does. And, and, and then for a moment, let's look at the baptism of Christ. Uh, did, did He know He was God? Absolutely. I believe He did. And, and was He filled with the Spirit before the, His baptism? Absolutely. I believe He was. I believe He was filled with the Spirit. Far beyond what we know or what we understand. Far beyond what you and I'll ever be till we get our glorified body. Amen. I, you know, my old flesh gets in my way. I don't know about yours. Amen. And, and when the Holy Ghost descended upon him like a dove, it signified the beginning of his earthly ministry. God already had the plan in motion. God knew what he was going to do. God knew the day he was going to do it. And, and Jesus did no miracle apart from the Holy Ghost and, and the direction of God. You search the scriptures, you'll not find it. Philippians 2.5 says this concerning us. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashions of man, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, Two things if you and I are going to be filled with the Holy Ghost of God. Number one, we're going to have to humble ourselves. We're going to have to get all the pride out. Number two, we're going to have to empty ourselves. You know, we're too prideful sometimes to do that. And the Bible does command us. It doesn't just teach. It commands us to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Ephesians 5.18 says, And be not drunk with wine, where does excess? but be filled with the Spirit. That's not just for the preacher or the Sunday school preacher, uh, teacher or the deacon or, or, or somebody, uh, one of the elder, uh, elder people in the church. That's for every born-again believer. And it's a command. It's not an option. There's no reason why we can't walk filled with the Spirit of God. It's our pride and our humility that we have to deal with all the time and getting ourselves out of the way. Filled. To be crammed full, like a, a, a net with fish. To, to level up to a hollow. I, I did an illustration one time about being filled with the Spirit. I took a quart jar to uh, class for my Sunday school class. And uh, I asked them, was there anything in the jar? And they didn't have anything in the jar at that time. No, there's nothing in the jar. I said, yes, there is. It's filled with something you can't see. It's filled with air. I took several ping pong balls. I put them in that jar. I said, is it filled? Yes, it's filled. I said, no, it's not. I took a little carton of BBs. looked like coming in a milk carton. I began to pour them BBs in there and they began to Fill up around all those ping pong balls, and I'd shake it, and I'd fill it on up, and I'd shake it, and I'd fill it on up, and it held that whole little pint of 
uh, BBs. And I said, is it full yet? Oh, yeah, it's full. I said, no, it's not. I pulled out some sand. And I began to pour that sand into that jar. And that sand, and I'd shake it, and it would go down around the BBs and around the ping pong balls, and it filled itself completely up until it run over. You see, that's what we need to do. We need to empty out self and be filled with the Holy Ghost of God. And we're filled by complete surrender to the will of God. That's the only way. And you know, I know a lot of folks, they're, they're good spiritual folks, but they don't walk in the Spirit because that they, they've got one little part of their life that they're not willing to turn over to God. And you know, I, I know some people think, well, if I surrender totally to God, He's going to call me to go to the mission field. Honey, He's not going to call you to go to the mission field if you won't go across the street and witness to your neighbor. Okay? Amen. You just God may have a special thing He wants you to do. Now, let's look at the characterization, characterization He gives here in verses 1 through 4. Uh, notice He starts out with that commendation we talked about. Always begin with commendation. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. I know thy works, that they were a working church. Active, busy. You know, you can have a lot of programs in your church, but unless those programs are led by the Spirit of God, and you've got people filled with the Spirit of God, they're not going to do anything. You're just going to have meetings. Okay, the the power had gone, and they didn't even know it. Amen. And, and many churches are like that today. Some of you just as well write Ichabod uh, over top of them and close the doors. Amen. Because uh, the glory's gone, the glory of God's departed, and uh, you know it, it's a shame that we see that in America, land of the free. He says, "Thou hast a name." They they had a name. They they said they were living, but they were dead. You know, everybody wants to make a name for himself. Amen. And no pride in us. We want to make a name for ourselves. And, and a lot of churches want to do that. Preachers want to get a big name. Well, boy, did you hear how many meetings I got booked and uh, preached last year? Did, did you see the size of the church that God called me to? Well, listen, there's little churches out here that's got eight or ten people that need to be pastored just as much as, uh, you know, uh, the First Baptist Church of Jack Frost. Amen. Amen. And, you know, they, they had a name. A and a good reputation for accomplishments, but they were dead spiritually. Spiritually, they were dead. This church turned in uh, good reports, baptized people, and they grew, but were dead. Did I mention they were dead? They were dead. That they would have been uh, at home in any cemetery. Amen. <laughs> and, and you know, many, many churches have gone to programs and elaborate rituals and many programs uh, that, uh, you know, leave God out completely. But, but they've substituted these for the preaching of the Word of God and real spiritual worship. Hey, the Word of God's got to be preached. Amen. Can, I, can I tell you three things real quickly? Number one, if there's going to be any illumination, it's going to have to be given by the Holy Spirit. Number two, that preacher is going to have to be filled with the Spirit of God. Amen? You're going to have to be filled, filled with the Spirit of God. And, and the Holy Ghost is going to have to take the spiritual book, the Bible, and He's going to have to reveal it to that man and... and then illumination will come. It's only that way, and it's always been that way. Uh, you know, uh, I, I know of a preacher one time, he had a youth group, and uh, his youth group began to grow by leaps and bounds. And he was preaching the gospel. Kids was getting saved. They was getting on fire for God. That church was almost on the verge of revival. And so somebody decided in the church, well, we need to have some programs for these kids to have them to have some fun. They begin to take them on field trips. They 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 took them here. They took them there. They took them to water parks. And they they got them intermingled in all these things. And you know what happened? It went south. Hey, preach 
the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Amen. Verse 3. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have uh, not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me uh, in white, for they are worthy. And, and he says, a few names. You know, ju- just a few left who really love God, who, who was still winning souls, uh, who came to prayer meeting, and, and who loved the Word of God. And, and you know, the greatest sin of, uh, uh, of those in Sardis was that they were staying in Sardis. They were staying in the Sardis church. That was their greatest sin. You know, uh, I believe you could call it the Deep Freeze Baptist Church of Sardis, North Carolina. Pastor Jack Frost with Frosty the Snowman as deacons and, and elders. Amen. They weren't accomplishing anything for the glory of God. And, and you know, I, I, I do not believe that God would want uh, one of his children to freeze to death in a dead church, uh, e- even you know if, if it was grandma's church. Amen. There's a lot of tradition around. It's it's not what grandma said or grandpa said or grandma did or grandma done. You know, it, it's what thus saith the Lord. And uh, you know we need to stand on that. Uh, I've got to go where I'm going to be spiritually fed. I've got to go where I can be active. I've got to go where I can serve the Lord. And uh, I get my family involved. Because, you know, when, when all the smoke clears and the dust settles, you know what's going to matter? Whether or not I, I've, I've given a good, good account before God with my family. Amen. That's going to be for all of us. Then the condemnation. Look in verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that, that, that uh, are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. I have not found thy works perfect before God, he said. Think about that. Uh, they fell short. Anybody ever read this scripture? For we all sin to come short of the glory of God. We do. And, you know, God does not expect any more out of us uh, than, than we're capable of doing, but, but the, these did not live up to their ability. Amen. There's no commitment anymore. Amen. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind and prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It takes commitment. Can I tell you what adults do today? They do exactly what they want to do. And you know what I've learned? People go be people. Uh, I, I've been there. I, I had a lady one time uh, getting ready to have revival at her church, and she said, "Preacher, I don't know why you do this. You you schedule revival every year right during the the, the basketball tournaments for my girls at church." I said, "Well, ma'am, I said uh, you you go right ahead. You go on to church. I go on to the school, and and y'all go ahead with your 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 meeting there." I said, "I can't I can't stop what God directed me to do." Uh, you know, if I'm going to line up with the calendar of the world, I said, we'll never have revival. I said, you go ahead on. I said, I'm not going to be mad at you. You know, she was in church every night that week. Amen. We do what we want to do. Amen. The consequences. He said in verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Uh, Think about this now. They were ready to die. He said, for I have found uh, thy works I have not found thy works perfect before God. We've got to be watchful. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, one of the fastest ways to, to wake up a dead church is, is to get the, the members in that church watching for the coming of the Lord. How many, how many sermons have you heard on, on the second coming lately? How many sermons have you heard in the last year on hell? Hey, Amen. I'm not being ugly. I'm just... Just tell the truth. And, and I think that any church is looking, uh, you know, for Jesus to come, it, it's not going to be dead. You, you'll get on fire again. You'll look for Jesus to come. Amen. And, and I'm not referring to setting dates, but the Bible does say, Be ye also ready, for the Son of Man shall come in an hour when you think not. Amen. He said, Watch therefore and pray. 
For if the goodman of the house had known what hour his Lord doth come, he would not have suffered his house to be broken up. He'd have watched. He'd have been looking. Amen. Strengthen the things which remain. Save the remains. You know, put, put life and love back into your works and your service. Church has to have life. It has to have love. And, and you know, uh, people, you know, they, they get in a bind and they, they quit coming to church. You got, you got to stay in church. You got to seek God. Can I tell you three things that will help you more than anything in your Christian life? Number one, stay in church. Number two, stay in the book. Number three, stay on your knees. It'll help you. You'll, you'll grow. You, you'll, you'll be walking that spirit filled life. Verse three, he said, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come unto thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Hey, the Lord told him to remember, and he told him to repent. You know, remember the things you've heard. The, the church had received some truth, but they left it. You know there's a lot of churches like that today. I, I, I've, I've counseled a couple people, you know, that I know, and, and I wasn't counseling them outside their pastor, but, but their pastor had left the book. One of them said, uh, Preacher, we're getting ready to vote on whether or not that we're going to allow homosexuals into our church. I said, You need to be finding you a church. I had another person tell me, Well, you know, we've used the King James Bibles for a year. Now we're going to the NIV. I said, You need to find a new church. I'm not throwing stones. Hey, the King James Bible works. It always has, always will. It's the Word of God. Inerrant, infallible. Amen. Inspired of God. And let me tell you, it's, it's going to last for all eternity. I believe Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Remember, therefore, how thou hast what thou hast received and heard. Hold fast. Hold fast. You know, hold fast to what? Truce. Truce. Can I, can I tell you? that the basis of all known truth is right here in my hand. And can I tell you, the truth changes nothing. J.C. House said this years ago at a, at a camp meeting, that the, the truth changes nothing. It's what we do with the truth. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to hold fast? Uh, are, are you going to stand for the truth? And we're going to have to draw some battle lines here before long. <clears throat> and we must ever hold on to the gospel and, and the truths that we've received in the preaching of the Word of God. And then he gives them a warning here. He said, repent or else I will come suddenly and without warning as a judge. You know, uh, the city of Sardis had been captured twice in its long history. And, and it was captured through carelessness. You know, we let things slip. You, you know how weeds get in your garden? A little bit at a time. And if you don't weed it out now and then, you know, you know what's going to happen? It's going to overtake it. You're not going to grow anything. And, and that's what happened. In 450, uh, 4, 549 B.C., let me get the letters right, 549 B.C., uh, a, a median uh, soldier scaled the, the parapet wall while the guard slept. Amen. How he got in? They let things slip. 218 B.C. A, a, a Cretan uh, likewise uh, slipped over the wall while the sentries were careless. Things creep in slowly. Okay. When we let down on our convictions and our standards, it creeps in slowly. And, and it happens in our lives. We've got to watch and we've got to be careful. We've got to hold fast. And, and you know, he said if they did not repent, the Lord would come upon them as a thief. 
And, and this injunction had real meaning for them. Christ uh, has many ways of bringing punishment upon the disobedient. Can I tell you, God will get your attention one way or the other. If you're His child, He'll get your attention. And you know, I believe sometimes He gets our attention as lost people. I have a, my wife and I have a five-year-old daughter buried in West Virginia right next to my mom and dad. And uh, I was bitter at God. I was bitter at my wife. I was bitter at the world. I was bitter at everybody. But you know what? God used that little girl as an instrument to bring me to salvation. He got my attention. Amen. He, he'll do what it takes. Amen. And then notice the conqueror's reward. If they, they would repent, they would hold fast. Notice what he would do in verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and uh, before his angels. Now, let me say something right here. I believe that there's two books. You say, preacher, you're going into left field. No, hear me out. There's two books. God has recorded every name that has ever been born. Even those little aborted babies, He knows them by name. Okay? Whether they give them to them or not, God's got a name for them. God knows them. Okay? When we get saved, our name is taken from the, the world's book and is placed in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. If your name's not found written there, you're not going. Amen. You read on down there where the great white throne judgment takes place and it says, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. Amen. I'm not just pulling something out of the air. Amen. It's there. This refers to the righteousness of Christ, clothed in white raiment. It refers to the righteousness of Christ with which we are clothed. Think about what uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says. It says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Isaiah 61.10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He hath covered me with a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Romans 3.21 says, now, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Verse 22, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. It doesn't make any difference who you are. If you'll believe and you'll trust, God will give you His righteousness if you simply ask for it. Verse 5, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And then he says, I will not blot his name out of the book of life. And I've already explained that. Right? So God has a book of names of every man. And then he's got the Lamb's book of life. I pray that yours is in it tonight. And, uh, you know, he says there, I will confess his name. Later on in that verse, I will confess his name before my father. I believe I read this somewhere. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. And, and you know, what grace to have Him confess us before the Father and for the holy angels. So, in a live church or a dead church? Amen. All right. Number two, verses 7 through 13, we're going to look at the church of Philadelphia. The church of brotherly love. That's what it means. Philadelphia means brotherly love. Oh, by the way, Sardis means prince of joy. You don't need that on your paper, but that's just a little information. I run across my reading. The church exhibits the characteristics of the true church even in its name. <laughs> you say, well, how do, we, how do we know that we're a part uh, 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 of the true church? Well, turn to 1 John chapter number 4. I'll get there in a minute. 1 John chapter number 4. And look in verse number 7. 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 7. Beloved, 
Let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. Verse 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In him was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son, I told you that a while ago, only begotten Son, amen, into the world that we might live through him. Hearing his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. That, that's a test of your salvation. Amen. Uh, now, there's some people that's harder to love than others. I'll have to admit that. But God commands us to love one another. Amen. We're to love them. <clears throat> and churches are splitting, I believe, because they lack love. There, there's no unity in the church. And, you know, we, we just got to keep loving one another. We just got to keep moving forward for God. And, and people can tell you, uh, you know, uh, uh, they love you. Have you ever had somebody stick their hand up to you and shake your hand and say, I love you? Look them in the eye. Shake their hand. Amen. Tell them you love them. Amen. And, and people can walk into a church. And they can tell whether you, the, there's love in that church or not. They can tell whether they love one another. They can tell whether they love sinners. Amen. Can I tell you something? If you see somebody backslidden or a sinner come into church and you're pointing out what they're wearing and what's going on in their life, you're the one that needs to go to the altar and repent. Amen. Say, preacher, you're awful hard. No, I'm just telling you the truth. Amen. Revelation 3, 7. If the angel of the church of Philadelphia write these things, saith, He that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Now, <clears throat> Christ reminds them that He's holy. Can, can I ask you a question tonight? What's wrong with being holy? It tells us over in the book of Deuteronomy, be ye holy for I am holy. Then it tells you in the book of Peter, as it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. What's wrong with being holy? Being set apart for God. Keeping our vessels clean and apart from everything else. And, you know, Jesus had two attributes. He was holy, number one. And then the next one we're going to look at in a minute is, is, is the fact that, that he was true. Okay. In, in Luke one thirty five, the Bible says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. And therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. He's holy. He was holy in his death. He was holy in his life. That's why he was able to die in our place and raise again on the third day. He lived a sinless life. Had he not lived a sinless life, you know where you and I'd be? Dead in our trespasses and sins. And uh, right now, uh, he's in an office and he's holy there. Hebrews seven twenty six: For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That's our God. That's our Savior. Not only is he holy, but uh, I think it's question number 12. He's true. He's true. John 1, 9 says, That is the true life which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, there's, there's one group. Let me, let me say this. I don't want to chase no rabbits here. There's one group that says that that verse right there tells you that everybody's saved. It doesn't say that. That was the true light, talking about Jesus, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. God gives every man a certain amount of light. It's when we seek after more light that He will give us more light and He will illuminate us to the point that we can be saved. Amen. Still got to get saved. Still got to come to the knowledge of the truth. Still got to recognize you're a sinner. Still got to realize that Jesus died for you and rose again on the third day. Amen. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 15, 1, he said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband. And true simply means genuine. Amen. I want to be truthful with people. I, I've dealt in business for the last 
50 years in construction, either working for myself or working for somebody, a company. And I've always took a lot of pride, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I took a lot of pride in being truthful with people. If I told them I was going to do something, I was going to do it. I had a man that come to me, and he said, uh, uh, I subbed from the guy you're working for, and I lost money. I said, no, you didn't. He said, you didn't. I didn't. I said, no. I said, you tell me how much you, he, he owed you. He told me. I, I handed him cash. He said, well, you, you didn't hire me. I said, I recommended you for the job. And I said, I'm responsible. And I'm going to take care of you. Amen. That's the way it ought to be. We ought to be as good as our word. We ought to be true. We ought to be genuine in all we do. And I want to tell you, little kids can tell whether you're genuine or not. They're the best judge. Amen. Amen. You better be careful. Around them little, little boogers. They, they'll, they'll search you out. And... Uh, Christ is the true bread. Think about this. In John 6, 32, Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. <clears throat> For the bread uh, of God is uh, he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Hallelujah. And I, I can't see, you know, Christians get themselves in a bind, go through dry places, they don't have to. I believe I read this somewhere, he that hungereth and thirst, thirsteth after righteousness shall be filled. That's a promise. Revelation 3, 7, he also talks about he that hath the key of David. Now, uh, Isaiah 22, 22 says, And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, and he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. Th this speaks of his kingly rights as the ruler of the whole universe. He, he's not just ruler of the world. He's ruler of the whole universe. Amen. And uh, can I say right here, this church had an open door service. Can I tell you, we've got an open door service today. You know, I, I know. Now, now I got common sense. And I, I think I told the class last year, uh, common sense is not a flower that grows in everybody's garden. Okay? But uh, I, I know we're living in some perilous time. I know that. But did you know what? We still got a God that can. God can send revival. God can save souls. God can use us. God can bless us. God can meet our needs. We just fail to give Him the honor and glory that's doing. And He opens and He shuts according to His will. Can I tell you He's sovereign today? We just got to follow Him. Then the commendation. He said, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. He said, I know thy works. And, and you know, knowing he still gave no uh, condemnation to this church. None at all. He, he, he loved this church. And, and I believe it's the church of today. He said, uh, you know, uh, I, I set before thee an open door and no man can shut. Hallelujah. Church is not going down. We're going up. We're going out. Amen. And note three reasons for the open door. They had a little strength. They, they knew it depended on God to give them power. Number two, they had kept the Word of God. They, they had convictions and standards and they guarded the cardinal doctrines. Amen. Then number three, they had not denied the name of Jesus. Uh, they boldly proclaimed Jesus everywhere they went. I think about that scripture in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God is not uh, that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Well, you know, I started confessing Jesus the day 
that I got saved and I haven't stopped since. Amen. How about you? I won't tell somebody. Amen. I'm just one beggar trying to now tell another beggar where to find bread. Amen. Revelation 3.10, he said, Because thou hast kept thy word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. They kept the patience, word of his patience. Uh, he promised that he would keep them from going through the hour of temptation or the great tribulation. They, they kept the word. They, they were patiently waiting for the Lord to come and, and take them out. Now, I, I, I know it sounds good when preachers preach it. I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. Well, can I tell you? Uh, that's 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 not right. Hey, I am looking for the upper taker, but you know, we don't know what our next minute holds. You can't promise me you'll be here tomorrow. I can't promise you I will. That's all in God's hands. He's sovereign, and He'll choose our time when we depart here. Now, I believe you can rush things. Be careful. Amen. They were patiently waiting. Then the consequences, an open door. Because of their love, they had opportunities to witness. You know, if you'll walk spirit, spirit field and you'll love the Lord, you'll love people, I guarantee you he'll open doors for you to witness. I, I remember not long ago, I was having some blood work done. And uh, the lady, she was probably in her 70s. And uh, she said, I need you day to birth. And I said, which one? And she looked at me. And she said, are you a transplant recipient? I said, oh, yes, ma'am, I am. She said, did you know the donor? I said, no, ma'am, I never met him till the day I got transplanted. And then she finally caught on. God will open doors for you to witness. You'll just listen and, and seek that opportunity. And, you know, I, I found out that, that just being yourself and, and, and being jovial and, you know, you, you can try to, well, if you don't get right with God, you're going to die and go to hell. There's three fingers point back. But I, I tell you, she just, she was overwhelmed. She looked at me when I was there and she said, Mr. Malay, I never will forget you. I said, well, praise the Lord. And, uh, of course, I was going to Northwood at the time, and I gave her I gave her a track and gave her directions to the church. She said, I'm coming to visit y'all. She said, I like you. <laughs> Amen. Hey, you can win people. God will open that door for you. And, and you know, we have great opportunities for winning souls. An open door. Amen. And, and if we fret, fail to go through that door, you know what's going to happen? God's going to close it. And, you know, false religions would be humbled before them. That's what it said. He said, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, verse 9, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them uh, to come and to worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Hey, can I tell you, he's going to exalt his church. He's going to say that remnant of Israel, uh, you know, and, and he's, going to, he's going to exalt them. God's not done with Israel. Don't, don't ever think that. Hey, he's going to bring them back. He said, even so, Romans 11, 5, even so, then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. They're coming back. And those who continued in the synagogue uh, were now in a false religion. They, they, they weren't true Jews. And, and Jesus will make the enemies of the Philadelphia church to know that he loves this church. Amen. God's going to put us on display one day as a, as a body of Christ, as a believers. And they would escape the tribulation. 
Because thou hast kept thy word from my patience. He said, I'll keep you from the hour of temptation. Now, that's going to be the 70th week of Daniel. That's going to be three and a half years. And can I tell you what's going to happen during the first three and a half years? You won't believe this. It's going to be peaceful on earth. There, there's going to be a, a charismatic man that's going to come on the scene. He's going to solve all the economic problems. He's going to solve all the uh, ecological problems. He's going to find new uh, ways to cure uh, cancer and all these things. Uh, I, I mean, uh, he, he's just going to have the answers to everything. But during the three and a half years, right at the midpoint, he's going to move in and he's going to declare himself to be God. And then the great tribulation. Amen. It's going to happen. He talks about him being a pillar. He said, I write in thy name of my God and thy name of thy city of my God, which is Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven uh, from my God, and I will write uh, upon him my new name. And, uh, and the pillar of the temple there. I will make a pillar in the temple. Uh, this speaks of a place and a position of honor. Amen. You've got pillars in the church, and then you've got pillars. Amen. You'll get that after a while. That's a redneck joke. A, a pillar denotes beauty, stability, and strength. And the church that had a little strength down here will have greater strength over in heaven. And this speaks of permanence and honor. Think about it. He shall go out no more, Revelation 3.12. Uh, forever they will be citizens of heaven. Aaron wore a crown of gold and uh, was graven upon it. Holiness is the Lord. Hey, he's holy. And I kind of look at this like it's our passport or visa for the believer uh, enables us to be a, a part of the citizen of heaven. And, you know, the pillar to go out no more. Amen. But with God's passport, guess what? We can go anywhere. We have a body like Christ. <laughs> Amen. We can do what we want to do for His glory. And I'll write upon them a new name. Now, I've got pet names I call my two girls. And uh, i got one reserved for each one of them. And, uh, you know, I kind of figure God's going to have a pet name for each other. I don't know what mine will be. I don't know what yours will be. But me and Christ will know. And that's what's important. See, he's not going to show any favoritism. He could be the same to all. That's what I like about my God. Hey, Brother Jeff, he's your God. He's your Savior. Hey, Brother Michael, he's your God. He's your Savior. Just like everybody in here, he's your God. He's your Savior. He's the same to all. Now, we can all get just as close as we want. Amen. I don't know about you, but I liked, I liked when I was a little boy scrooching up close to my daddy. That's a wheelbilly term, scrooching up. Amen. And, you know, think about this. Of, of all the contrast to the earth conditions, where those who are in the Great Tribulation receive the mark of the beast in their foreheads, we're going to get a new name. Hallelujah. Sardis was a church to get out of. Philadelphia was the kind of church you'd want to belong to. And the Philadelphia church was on fire, was soul winning, was teaching the Word of God, and was teaching it in love. Just a thought tonight. Are you in the right church? Are you in the right church? Can I tell you what I think about my church? I think I belong to the greatest church in America. Amen. Michael, I believe you belong to the greatest church in America. Amen. We ought to, we ought to feel that way about our church. 
We ought to exalt our church because it's the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for our time together. And uh, Lord, uh, I pray you'll take the, the thoughts and uh, the things that I've said tonight. God, I know some of them were scattered, but God, I know that you can take these things and you can bring order out of them and you can make sense out of them. And I leave that with you. God bless our class. And Lord, I pray you'll uh, touch them, give them strength, give them grace. Bless the respective churches and their uh, services tomorrow night and this week. And may you get glory in all this done. We'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.